with how near the realms deep and steam next fest were, I've decided to compile my impressions alphabetically in this video. Greetings, I'm the Italian Skeleton, you know what to do? Let's start with Abglance, first person shooter inspired by Quake. So, in my years of gaming, I've noticed that I get attracted to a game when it has one of three things. An amazing clear original idea, either mechanical or thematical, ideally both, a unique mashup of two or more already explored concepts, or be a heartfelt knockoff. I don't perceive any of these three concepts in Abglance. What it's there is not done badly, but I don't see it something appealing to my taste. Though, to be fair, the sound and art design do give the intended creepy vibes. It's also kinda stingy with ammo, though this could just be a defect of the demo. Still, not my cup of tea, and not an experience I'm looking for right now. Next, Acheron, first person shooter inspired by the PS1 era games. First of all, I got attacked when spawned. Why? Please don't put enemies right in front of the player. I like the art design. It follows the style of games like MDK2 and Uprising, Join or Die, two games I'm familiar with. Also, the low resolution textures and models do the wobbly thing of the PlayStation 1. It seems decent enough, although I feel like this is going to be more expensive for the visuals and retro vibes, honestly. Why? Well, the demo lasted only 5 minutes, which makes me suspect that this is going to be an afternoon of entertainment project in scoop, but the gameplay does feel good. It could be fun. Next, Biomorph, 2D Metroidvania, or as I like to call them, explorative platformers. The general mechanics are fairly standard for the genre, but there is one killer feature. Once defeated certain enemies, it's possible to get their forms and transform into them and use their abilities. That's cool. Also, monsters become stronger the more you buy morph into them, as in, they get new behaviors and learn to adapt. That's a neat way to balance difficulty. You can also swap forms as needed, necessary for some puzzles. Nice. The ads are is cute although I do suggest in blue in the background a bit to better differentiate it from the playable area. Depending on the scene, it may not be clear and could be confusing. But overall, this is neat. Gets a wishlist from me. Next, Calcium Contract. First person shooter made in GZ Doom. I have a soft spot for cartoony games, so it already starts on a good foot. It's so colorful and silly. This reminds me of Karina of Time, when Link must go to the mountain with the... Uh, Gerardus? No, Gorons. The story is, Quetzalcoatl doesn't want to die, so you, the unpaid intern I presume, must make him. It's adorable. And the weapons follow the same design philosophy as the graphics. Here is a machine gun that shots dog biscuits. The skulls on the equivalent of the pistol are doing the dude to shoot, which also gives a diegetic reason for why it has infinite ammo. They are also interesting to use, as the bullets also ricochet leaving a trail, which can be advantageous in certain situations. The game does have a cut enemy that uses a hitscan gun in short range, which sucks, but it does become a much more tolerable sniper at long range. I don't like it, but it's possible. Also, weapons, items, and health reset at the start of every level. Interesting choice of design. Usually I'm a hoarder for consumable items. This has made me use them more frequently in a way that did not feel forced. Obligatory. Do you like hurting other people? And the music is slow and chill, I like it. Overall, this is cute and right down my alley. I'll keep an eye open. Next, Cyber Combat. First person speed shooter. Allow me to explain. A current trend that has been getting a foot in the shooting genre is the concept that I define as speed shooter, aka FPS that aren't just fast paced like the ones of old, but also focus a lot more on vertical movement and platforming challenges. Cyber Combat, with its throne like aesthetics, is one such shooter specifically in one with some bullet hell style gameplay. 
it's quite fun. The grappling hook gives a lot of versatility, and the visuals have a certain degree of spectacles. The neon lights do not limit the scenery, they enhance it. One aspect that I think could be beneficial for this game is the addition of boss fights at the end of each level. I think the moveset leans a lot towards them. Still, looks fun. Another wishlist. Next, Drake. Top down RPG. Oh boy. When releasing a demo, the developer should make sure that the content feels like a finished and polished experience. Like, if they ripped a few levels from the completed game. This is not the case. Let's do things in order. After creating a customized backstory for my character, and gave a look at the starting area to get a feel of the world, including a trial to know how the shooting feels, I got my first taste of the game, in the starting mission in the mines. I noticed how I can screw up a side quest with the wrong response, as it should. I also witnessed how one of my choices for the backstory altered the options to deal with an encounter, so far pretty standard and ok. The not ideal fact happens after shooting at some bugs. My character goes into the caves, then the game transforms itself into a text adventure, not intended to be a part of the final release. Why implement this? It did give me the freedom to explore and to be aware of spoilers, but I did not feel like exploring. Why make the rest of the world instead of flashing on the starting chapter? I tried the swarm mode and it was not fun. And this left a sour taste in my mouth. The developers need to get back to the drawing board and reading their approach, because this demo did not show their capabilities in the best light. Next, Dungeons 4, an agile and strategy game inspired by Dungeon Keeper. I have experience with the series, specifically with Dungeons 3. It managed to capture the experience of being an evil underlord good enough, both in its management and fighting aspect. And the overworld fights, something that the original Dungeon Keeper did not do, helped the game to distinguish itself from its source material. However, there are three main problems with the series that Dungeons 4 seemingly does not fix. 1. Unoptimized commands for the overworld fights, such as the lack of any way to give information to your minions, making your troops move in amorphous blobs of flesh ripe for ambushing. 2. Buildings taking too long to be destroyed, making progression a slog. And 3. Being a supposedly committed game, but actually not. This, she proudly presented it to the absolute evil in its form as the Dungeon World. And so misfortune took its course, because at the same time, Talia wanted to demonstrate how loudly she could snap her fingers. But this snap, which would go down in the history books as the Dungeon Lord snap, unleashed horrific forces that were discharged into the Dungeon Lord himself. rose to her feet, the gauntlet had disappeared, and the Dungeon Lord lay dying. Viewers often began to cry at this point, because it made them think back to the last really good superhero movie. Not even the voice talent of Kevin Brighton can fix what is, essentially, an unfunny script. Apart from this, it's actually an ok game, but, again, those were the same flaws that Dungeons 3 had. It's frustrating that such issues still linger on. Next, Echo Point Nova, first person speed shooter on Cloud Islands, my favorite setting. Much more leaning towards the classic shooting mechanics compared to Cyber Combat, but those things manage it differently. Like, this one has limited ammo, it also implements the speed factor in another way. How? Well, apart from the standard double jump, it uses an overboard and it allows the player to use it whenever they want, letting to some pretty nuts moves. But that's just one component. Others include a hook that can attach to any surface instead of prefixed points, a hammer that can create a passage by smashing the stone ruins, does not work on meta or the terrain though. Yes, I have fallen through the void searching for treasures. No, it does not do anything. And also some nifty abilities gained later on like creating wind jump pads, necessary to reach faraway places. It also does some other things on the side, like some customization option for when playing co-op, a level up system where you can equip the models finder on the level with various effects. Also I like the ladder on the bottom that suddenly tells you when you are close to one, and ultimately tell the context of the game with text logs. Some are funny. Oxygen levels? Earth-like. Gravity? Earth-like. Life form hostility? Earth-like. Hostile. Overall, 
another enjoyable shooting experience that's going to be part of my evergreen backlog sooner or later. Next, Forgive Me Father 2. First person shooter with Lovecraftian inspirations for the story and art design. Fairly standard, neat graphics, but I think that using 2D sprites instead of 3D models for the characters was not the right choice. It looks distracting when everything else is fully modeled. That's an awful place to put a salami hunger. Sound effects are meaty enough. I also like the idea of the flashlight that must be recharged manually. Gives horror vibes. Especially when it runs out while fighting. And you have to make quick priority decisions. On the gameplay side of things, enemy bullets are physical. Good. I hate its guns in rather inspired shooters. Once beaten a level, you get sent back to the hub. I don't think this is the best poster to put in an asylum, but I digress. The pills are stores for two categories. Blue pill upgrades weapons, red pill upgrades eldritch powers. This last one is also where to equip those powers. Once done all that, it's time to get back into the fray. Fire does not do damage. Lame. Overall, it looks like a decent shooter. I can still play in this when I want to relax and don't feel like playing something completely new. Next, Galaxy Highways, level based top down shooter. This is something I tried more for curiosity, as I'm not really into top down shooters, but I can see that if you're a fan of this genre, you may enjoy this. Side note, there is a dash move that makes you invulnerable, therefore, by the laws of the internet, I'm legally obligated to label this game as a source like. Sorry. I don't make the rules. Anyway, the maps are divided in zones, where the objectives are. The greater the alarm in a map grows, the stronger the waves of enemies become. Once done all the objectives, you must retreat to the spawning portal. Retreating and running away aren't comps exploited much in action games. It's always refreshing to see them and how they've been implemented. And the map is not strict with its primary and secondary objectives. You can choose which to tackle first and in which order. When completed certain objectives, you may get some parts. Green ones build new buildings at the base, granting passive buffs, and once enough red parts are acquired, a special battleship is unlocked. And it's really funny to use. It was a cathartic experience to be a bringer of total destruction. Not my cup of tea, but there is a lot of passion put into this. I can see the people who enjoy this genre enjoying this too. Next, Luna Abyss. First person shooter mixed with bullet hell movesets. The shooting is fairly uninteresting. The only thing worth noting is that the guns have infinite bullets, but can hurt it, leaving you vulnerable. But gameplay is not the main focus, it's the story. And this is probably one of the games that shall be talked about the most after its release. It's the kind of game with obtuse lore that you have to reconstruct bit by bit by reading the documents, interpreting the graffiti on the walls, this one in particular is a reference to the This is not a place of honor, a message engineered to warn future generations about the danger of nuclear waste in case the concept of nuclear radiations were to be lost somehow, and try to understand what the heck the characters are saying. Your records say you grew up in New London. A sinful place according to the old father. I suppose I shouldn't be surprised. This is the kind of game where everyone talks in allegories, rhetorical figures, euphemism, symbolism and other abstract talk constantly. Like, if you ask a character what's 1 plus 1, they will tell you how mathematics is the divine language that allows us mere humans to understand the complexities and beauties of the infinite universe, while never actually responding to the question. How long have you been down here? We create time where none exists. It has no material meaning, no worth with which to measure. Everything that is exists only as the sum total of what was and what is yet to come. As the snake swallows its own tail, so time swallows itself. Do you see? I'm not sure I do. It also does the narrative trope of who can you really trust that this topic science fiction usually does. Also, voice acting is uh, inconsistent. Listen to these three lines and then the next two. I probably should have warned you about the Mother Eyes network. 
Oops. No. I am... a relic of different times. Looking for a piece of technology? Something called a shield breaker. Oh! Mother! Uh, there's an intruder! Uh, death to the intruder! Death to you! You! Mother warned me about you! You, you, you shouldn't be here! You, you, you need to leave! So yeah, serviceable gameplay, but interesting setting and story. I'll keep an eye open. Next, Mala Petaka. Right out of the gate. There are three things that I don't like about this game. A design choice I'm going to talk about later. The fact that the options menu have not been redrawn to follow the style of the game. If Calcium Contract can do it, so can this. And the 8 bit music. For personal taste. Having said that, Mala Petaka is what I think all shooters made with GDC Doom should strive to do. The colored art style makes it stand out from the usual Doom palette. The classic guns have received a unique twist, like how the shotgun can shoot 3 times when pressing with the right mouse button, but must be pumped 3 times afterwards. Or how the pistols can shoot one high damaging laser at the cost of more ammunition. Or how the grenade launcher is... Ok, it's a grenade launcher, but it's still cool. Every single non-melee enemy has projectile bullets. There are no hit scans. It's beautiful. Main and only real complaint, sometimes it's unclear what the end doors do. Like here. The ice one is a harder bonus soil where, once defeated the second round with the previous boss, you can gain a double ice shotgun. The other door brings you back to the hub. I wish it was made clear with a sign or something. There is also this quick where pressing C makes the game go into turbo mode. Happened a couple times while trying to crouch. Pressing X makes it go to a normal speed. Overall, great demo. Game looks promising and fun. Can't wait to play it. Next, Monomyth. First person dungeon crawler slash immersive sim RPG. How do I know this is an immersive sim? You can take some dough, put it on a fire and make bread. Wash dirty bandages in water to reuse them, and play a harp, with every chord assigned to a number. I like the menu selection. It reminds me of the first medieval for the PlayStation 1. It also has an interesting story premise, with the protagonist voluntarily going to a forgotten city to retrieve a sacred object to calm the angry gods, lest the kingdom falls but it's extremely slow paced to a fault. I get it what they're going for. This is a dark, uncaring and cruel world, not really given to you. Everything's out there to get you. You'll have to scrounge for scraps in every corner just to survive. Kind of tutorial. I get it. But please, fasten things up a bit. Since the story is about the royal heir going on a quest, a direct tutorial where the hero trains for the previous journey will make sense and be appreciated. As long as once reach the city, the player can immediately get on with the flow. Still, this has potential. I hope the project matures to its fullest. Next, Necro Fugitive. 2D stealth action platformer. Man, this threw me back. It reminds me a lot of Prototype from 2009. And considering the developer has confirmed that it was one of the inspirations, I can say that the project is on the path to nail it. First, the stealth is implemented just the same way, as you can absorb any guard, take their likeness and move unseen. To balance it, moving while hidden consumes stamina, and the other guards can recognize that you are an imposter if you stand in their field of view for too long. It also handles punishment brilliantly, for if discovered, the gate leading to the next level closes, and you can't escape without smashing it. But your regular claw attacks are not enough. Neither are the patterns and movements of the absorbed soldier. Each one has his own by the way. The only option is by unleashing the beast. Though, again, if you are good enough, you can sneak by and reach your objective unnoticed, saving you a lot of headaches. I am impressed. It's definitely going to take a while, but I believe that this can be a great hit. Next, Paint Over. First person puzzle game about paintings coming to life. I find it hard to describe because it's, well, exactly what it says on the tin. You must find the solutions to puzzles in the paintings. Also obligatory Fahrenheit 451 reference. I guess I can describe how the puzzles work at the start. Usually they're about perspective. Depending on your angle you may see different things. 
you don't have to stay right next to the painting to activate it. The position from which you look can influence how to find the solution. You can't brute force. The numerical lock will deactivate temporarily after some wrong answers. The paintings aren't static. Things in them can move and be frozen on what is happening. I love this ravaging Van Gogh reference. Turns out it's actually the painter, or at least someone who claims it to be. He gives a brush and a diary. Now it's possible to make symbols on the paintings. And the first sign is a lighting bolt. It can light up and energize the things inside. And please, whatever you find in this world, don't judge me too harshly. Mate, I've been on the internet for half of my life. You can't surprise me. The game can be very picky on what a lighting looks like. Hint, always make the lower stroke bigger than the upper one. It's possible to make other signs without knowing them. Like here, I made a rocket, somehow. And the setting is not limited to just a museum, but inside the paintings themselves, there is a lot of weird stuff. And things that want to come out, but maybe shouldn't. Oh, of course, if you allow the player to draw anything, you must draw dicks. It's tradition. Overall, it looks fun and interesting, and surprisingly heavy on the computer. My fans were running at full speed the whole time. Still, it's a wish list. I'm curious what other puzzles are going to be here. Next, Phantom Fury, old school first person shooter, although slower pace compared to others in this genre. This was probably the most hyped demo for the festival, and for good reason. Many are hoping for what it could be the Duke Nukem Forever that the fandom never got, although there are many things that still need to be ironed out. Like for I went to test the Bionic Punching Arm, and my gun disappeared, or how guns don't feel meaty, they still need much polishing. Railroad sound is fine, or how the AI has some uh, quirks to fix, or how the reflections don't work. 0 out of 10, worst shooter ever. Having said all of that, I still have faith in the project, for there are a lot of things I enjoyed. Like this part with the crane puzzle, it reminds me of the 3D shooter platformers for the PlayStation 2 like Jack and Dexter 2, especially when I had to use the arm of the crane as an improvised bridge. The variety in enemy design with the zombies. This is going to be a Duke Nukem Forever. Whether it's going to be a good or bad thing, we shall see. Playing with the environment is neat. Not just with the actual arcade games, but also screwing bombshells aim with alcohol. And as a last pearl of interactivity, the water goes down to the point of the bullet hole, then it stops. Am I seeing things or this looks identical to a Warhammer 40k drop pot? The thing has a pegs for guns, arms and other things though. So yeah, it's a rough demo, but I fate it's going to be fixed and be a good game in the end. Next, River. First person speed shooter. I'm not going to be around the bush. This is an ultra kill homage. There are some differences. The setting, for example, everyone is a robot, sure, but instead of them needing blood to survive, it's more like that their city has been invaded by Forsaken. The slam on the ground is used to gain hate is unique to River, and punching the bullets does not speed them up, but unleash a unique attack per weapon. Everything else, though, is. Well, ultra kill inspired. Like, there are movesets for the weapons, religious symbolism everywhere, the robots bleed profusely, you get held back by killing enemies, robots explode in showers of blood when they die, the best way to avoid damage is by being fast and flashy, everything is ludicrously exaggerated, and the boss fights end in, uh, you guessed it, a shower of blood. Overall, your appreciation for this game hinges on your appreciation for Ultra Kill or its design philosophy, as this is pretty much made of the same cloth. Not that I consider it a bad thing, I've already expressed my opinion about heartfelt knockoffs, both at the start and in my silver video, so yeah, I'll keep my eyes open. Next, Relentless Frontier, first person shooter made with GZ Doom, focusing on space bugs instead of demons. The biggest differences are Omnifuo, a resource that can be converted for health, armor or ammo, though there are still the regular pickups for the tree. The Omniblade, 
which transforms killed enemies with it in Omni Fuel, the fact that some enemies have armor and you can't damage them until it is destroyed with either stronger weapons or explosives, and ultimately there are abilities to gain. Just one nitpick, please don't use the usual Doom menu, customize it to fit the art style. Apart from that, this looks like fun and with some twists to make the experience fresh, I'll keep it in mind. Next, Robocop Rogue City, hybrid first person shooter and RPG. Now, this is something that surprised me. The mix between first person shooter and open RS RPG were implemented extremely well. Granted, the shooting may be a little simple, as you can only use the iconic pistol or random gun you can find on the ground, but it makes up in spectacles. The main story made ad hoc to help people like me technology general setting that are unfamiliar with the details was the right choice, and the side quests available give interesting smaller stories of everyday criminality. The semi open maps with secrets to fire remind me of Deus Ex Human Revolution in some aspects. Wait, no, the whole game reminds of Human Revolution in many ways actually. Small nitpick, the animations were not very expressive. It happened more than once where the voice actors were trying to convey an emotion and the model almost stared blankly or used the default senses. For example, look at this scene here. A concerned mother is looking for her son. When she receives the news that he is dead, she is devastated, crying, but her face is not really expressive and she is still crossing her arms. Your son was found dead two hours ago. What? Still, this looks great and an easy wish list. Next, Snap the Sentinel, first person shooter made in GZ Doom. I have a soft spot for games that go for a cartoony art style. Mixed with the fact that the game avoids hit scans enemies makes it even more charming. Plus, the music and graphics ooze with 90s vibes. Something that struck me is how it handles the challenge. Once beating a level at normal difficulty, hard is unlocked. But it's not the usual bump in enemy stats one expects. Things become radically different, like how to progress you must find the rooms where usually secrets in normal difficulty are held, and how the enemies don't have their stats changed but are positioned in different places, and also how there are more of them. There are some minor quirks that irk me, like the fact that the hands look detached from the body, or how the bullets become a bit hard to distinguish between yours and one of your enemies during fights. Also, not having a jump pattern, but still needing external ways to prevent yourself upwards. This is going to take some use to, but the only nitpicks for what I see as a great time. Next, Solium Infernium, turn-based political strategy. I like many things about this project, the setting, the lore and the depth. The story is, Lucifer has disappeared and now his subordinates are fighting against each other to determine who is worthy to replace him and sit on his throne. To achieve their goal, each one of them shall use every trick they can master, from brute strength to the subtlest subterfuge, to the most daring of schemes, to straight up political pressure. Everything is allowed in hell. What I did not enjoy was the combat, the animations are rather dull to see, and the lack of a proper campaign. Though. The devs are going to implement different scenarios. The tutorial is especially bad. I could not understand half of the mechanics. I had to play it twice to understand them. Despite that, this project does pique my interest, and I shall observe how it develops. Next, Songs of Silence. Mix between a turn-based strategy, real-time strategy game, and a hint of card collecting. Have you ever had the experience of having a game in your Steam wishes and not remember why you put it there? Well, I had this experience with Songs of Silence. But man, was this fun! To mix two genres and a half must have been a massive undertaking. Add to this an exquisite art style and an intriguing plot took and what comes out is nothing short of fantastic. The gameplay loop reminds me a lot of Heroes of Might and Magic 5, one of my favorite turn-based games. Songs of Silence hits many of the right notes. The city building is very simplistic in comparison to it. Apart from common recruits, only one special building that allows you to recruit one special unit is allowed per settlement, but oh man, was I intrigued for the whole time. The automatic real-time battles may be a little simple, 
but I do enjoy how you can influence the outcomes with the cards available to your hero. My only petition is that I get the chance to play as the undead faction near the silence, with their dedicated missions and story, but apart from this, the game seems like an extremely polished experience with nothing to envy to AAA productions. Next, Sorceress, first person action adventure immersive scene following the steps of Dark Messiah. If there is one budget I could pick from the festival and make sure that it became a success, it would be this one. For one solo dev to tackle the challenging task of creating an immersive sim RPG is nothing short of incredible. Everything felt so smooth that I didn't even notice I was playing an immersive sim at the start. You know what gave it away? Not how the fire can burn wooden objects, including doors, nor the directional attacks, but how I could impale enemies on spikes kick them down into the abyss for a swift victory, light the arrows with the fire of the torches, and ultimately the bubble gun, which shows off the game physics, activating a lever behind bars by generating gravity defying bubbles. And there are even more sick ideas like a nice gunlet that works in synchrony with the bubble gun. This left me intrigued and craving for more. It's my favorite theme of the festival. I truly hope it manages to deliver on its promises. Next, Sovereign Syndicate, top-down RPG without combat. From the selection of an archetype from which to start, to the voices in the head of the protagonist that won't stop talking, ah, yes, playable schizophrenia, to the skill checks, to the multiple choices that have unique outcomes, to the fact that the more an option is taken, the more the associated humor grows, making some skill checks easier, it is clear that Sovereign Sendek is inspired by Disco Elysium, as it follows many of its design principles. However, the differences, like the setting taking place in a Victorian fantasy steampunk London, the definitions that explain the ye old English slang, to the plot took about a royal serving stranger wanting to know about the sacred heart, an orphanage in which the protagonist lived before running away. I'm also thinking that the temperament is unique to this game, Unique options appear depending on what mood the protagonist is, even ones that can bring him to an early demise, help to differentiate it from its source material. There is so much potential for replayability. You know what you could see if you make different choices? Unique areas, unique interactions, unique dialogues, unique quests, and who knows what else. The developers are facing an uphill battle, but I think they had the will to tackle it. Next, Terminator, Dark Fate. Defiance. Real-time tactics strategy game with huge focus on territorial control and ammo management. My biggest fear was the lack of environmental variety. If you know about the Terminator setting, the future tends to look a bit bluish grey and demolished. Glad that it's not the case. What struck me the most was not the limited ammo for the troops. A neat idea, though not confined to this game, but how the soldiers move and shoot. I suspect it simulates every aspect of this too, to the point I've seen some bizarre bugs and vehicles getting stuck sometimes. The story seems alright, with the review commander having to face off the consequences of his own choices, while trying to balance between the pragmatism of war and the moral duty of saving civilians. One thing I hope the campaign does is show Skynet's point of view and let the player control the robots. I think it could be an interesting experience for gameplay's variety's sake and also to hear the corny monologues about the differences between machine and human. It's a variety in troop and interesting in seeing more in media. Overall, a lot of potential, but needs more polishing. Next, The Last Exterminator, first person shooter inspired by the early 2000s era. There is not much to say about this because it's very straightforward on what it wants to be, an FPS that follows the same steps as the original Duke Nukem 3D. Those alien bastards are gonna pay for blowing up my van. Damn, those alien bastards are gonna pay for shooting up my ride. One thing I want to say, it looks nice. It follows the same halfway through classic and modern graphics that some retro inspired shooters go for. Fluid reload animation too. And it's not afraid to ramp up the spectacles. The demo was stingy with ammo, dead enemies do not release it consistently, had the fist for a good chunk of it. Don't punch fire extinguishers though, kids, I had to learn the hard way. This feels like a polished, but not groundbreaking experience, 
I guess it can be good for someone wishing for something familiar. I'll say, it's a maybe for me. Next, Tower of Kalemonvo. Hack and slash fantasy RPG, or as I call them, computer action RPGs. This is a love letter to the first Diablo like no other. It emulates the feeling to a fault. If you told me I was seeing an HD mod for the original game, I would believe you without question. Though it does things slightly differently. Like, at the start you don't choose a class but two weapons. Why? Because the game uses a classless system. You can use any weapon and any ability. As long as you have the stats needed. While it does not really appeal to me, I can see those having nostalgic feelings for the original game getting a pleasant experience. Next, Tyrant's Realm. Third person RPG souls like, but with procedurally generated levels. Pretty standard, but some unique aspects. The armor and the weapons are color coded. This is no coincidence. There are shines that can buff only certain colors. To unlock new stuff you need to bring the blueprint to a merchant. Make sure to have enough coin to unlock them in the game. Also to heal you don't use flasks, but whole cooked chickens. The double handed swords are OP, they make you fat troll, but I defeated the two bosses in the demo with 8 or 9 strikes, they are ludicrously strong. I wish I could tell you more about the story, but the game drops the character in the middle of a dungeon without any kind of cutscene or explanation. Even the weapons don't have much flavor text, which is usually the main way this kind of game is used to tell their lore. I am not going to follow it right now, I still need to play Neo 2, Lies of P, Elden Ring, Jedi Fallen Order and Survivor, Bloodborne, if there gets a PC release, so if you have played all of these it might be worth a try. Next, Warhammer Age of Sigmar, Realms of Ruin, real time tactics game set in the universe of Age of Sigmar. The parallelism with Dawn of War 2 is evident, from the squad management to the special abilities that both units and commanders can execute to turn the tide of battle. Concluding with its resource gathering aspect, with the only difference being able to choose which one of the two resources are not shall harvest. However, because this is melee focused, the fights are a lot slower, everything feels like it's moving in molasses, coupled with the fact that units cannot disengage from a fight unless you shoot a retreat order becoming unusable until they reach the base, makes the whole combat feel stiff, and the units require a lot of time to regenerate naturally. I also don't like how the game just continually spawns units from a point outside the map with no way to plug them out. It's really frustrating to leave some units behind for protection. It gives a bad sensation of not making any progress towards clearing the area. I want to stay optimistic though and I hope the devs manage to tune it before the November release. And with that, I end the video. If you want to see the raw unedited footage for all the demos, or even use them in your videos, I have left a link in the description. If you want more, there is also my previous video about the Strategy Fest. In any case, farewell and thanks for watching.